Exodus, a central theme of Exodus. After covering the time of the patriarchs and matriarchs, fathers and mothers, we will now turn to our attention, turn our attention to how God formed his people Israel. Regarding this period, the Catechism succinctly teaches, and I quote, After the patriarchs, God formed Israel as his people by freeing them from slavery in Egypt. He established with them the covenant of Mount Sinai, and through Moses gave them his law so that they would recognize him and serve him as the one living and true God, the provident father and just judge, and so that they would look for the promised Savior. This excerpt identifies the essential theme of Exodus as entailing liberation from slavery. It does not, though, define this liberation, this freedom from slavery, as primarily a political liberation from a tyrannical pharaoh. Instead, Exodus depicts the liberation that Israel experienced as first being a spiritual liberation in two primary ways. Freedom to worship the one true God, freedom from Egyptian idolatrous and immoral practices, so as to live in accordance with the gift of the law given on Mount Sinai. In describing this law, Pope Francis teaches, and I quote, Law is itself a gift of God which points out the way, a gift for everyone without exception. It can be followed with the help of grace, even though each human being advances gradually with the progressive integration of the gifts of God and the demands of God's definitive and absolute love in his or her entire personal and social life. The freedom to worship God and the freedom to live in accordance with our created natures as images of the holiness of God, which the law in Sinai provides a central direction for, are significantly more important than the land promised to Israel. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. Exodus 6, 8. In explaining that the Mosaic Covenant given on Mount Sinai is a more important end than even the promised land, Benedict XVI writes that the goal of the Exodus was freedom, But one must add that the figure of freedom is the covenant and that the form in which freedom is realized is the right relation of men to one another described in the law of the covenant. And this relation is derived from the right relation to God. In contrasting the end of the promised land with the gift of the law on Mount Sinai, Benedict XVI writes, And I quote, one can understand that the land was definitively numbered among the goals of the Exodus. For no doubt, it is part of the freedom of a people to possess a land of its own. But at the same time, it becomes evident that in a certain respect, Sinai remains superior to the land. For if Israel loses Sinai in its land, that is, if it destroys the law and the covenant and dissolves the order of freedom through the disorder of caprice, then it has returned to the pre-Exodus condition. It then lives in its own land and yet is still in Egypt because it destroys its freedom from within. The exile makes visible in a merely external political way the prior inner loss of freedom through the loss of justice. One must thus say that what is truly liberating in the Exodus is the institution of the covenant between God and man which is concretized in the Torah, that is, in the ordinances that are the form of freedom. Accordingly, the exodus is made possible not by the particular boldness or industry of Moses, but by a religious event. The paschal sacrifice, which anticipates an essential ingredient of the Torah, if this is expressed as a primordial knowledge of humanity, one encountered ever again in the history of religion, that freedom and the formation of community are ultimately to be attained, not through the use of force or through mere industry, but through a love that becomes sacrificial and that first binds men together in their depths because it lets them touch the dimension of the divine. 
Thus, at the core of the Old Testament liberation event, there is incipiently present that which later emerges openly in the figure of Jesus Christ and from him becomes the means to a new history of freedom. In Exodus chapter 4, God emphasizes the more important end of divine worship by commanding Moses to say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go so that he may serve me. Exodus 4, 22-23. God in chapter 3 and 5 further clarifies his request by commanding Israel to leave Egypt journey into the desert for three days, and there offer sacrifice. Israelites were also to bring animals from their flocks and herds from which to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings to the Lord, Exodus 10.25. The animal sacrifices, explains Petrie, were requested by God as a way of purifying the Israelites from the years of captivity in Egypt where animals such as these were worshipped. For example, The Egyptian goddess Hathor was often portrayed in the form of a cow. Ammon was typically represented with ram features, Bastet as a cat, Thoth as a baboon, or Ibis and Anubis as a jackal. Secondarily, liberation from Egypt did entail political freedom from a tyrant. Often, this consequence that flowed from the being spiritually liberated to freely worship the true God is presented without reference to the more essential spiritual liberation. Overemphasizing the political liberation the Israelites experienced obscures, hides the relationship that Israel was intended by God to have with Egypt and all other nations. Israel, as explained previously, was chosen by God to be the firstborn son, so that beginning with Israel as a priestly people, as a mediator of salvation, God may, part by part, bit by bit, gather all the nations scattered by sin back to himself. Israel, however, often failed in her God-given mission to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation that leads the nations out of idolatry to worship the true God. This failure entailed falling into the idolatrous practices of those nations Israel was called to free from idolatry. God responded to Israel's repeated regressions into idolatry by making concessions to the law he originally gave to them so that Israel would not be totally lost and assimilated into pagan cultures. For example, points out Petrie, before the worship of the golden calf, there is no mention of God stating that he will separate the Israelites from the other nations by driving out those nations before Israel or God commanding Israel to eliminate these people. Instead, The emphasis is on Israel being a priestly nation to the pagan nations, on Israel's role of mediating God's salvific will. After the worship of the golden calf, after Israel had demonstrated its weakness towards pagan ways, after 11 of the 12 tribes had lost their priesthood and was replaced by the remaining Levitical priesthood, God then decrees a separation from these people that God will bring out. Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you go. Let it become a snare in our midst. Exodus 34, 11 through 12. In the verses that immediately follow, God also commands the Israelites to tear down the altars of the inhabitants and forbids Israelites from making a covenant with the inhabitants, Exodus 34, 15. Petrie interprets these passages as indicating that now that 11 tribes have lost their priestly status, they have, in a sense, also lost their ability to be priests who lead pagan nations back to the one true God, as in the early days of Noah. In its place, they are tasked with the non-priestly, secular task, states Petrie, of destroying pagan items and ensuring a separation takes place between Israel and the other nations. 
When Israel fails in her call to be a holy nation by being seduced by the sexual and idolatrous practices of the Moabites and Midianites, God intensifies the requirement of separation between Israel and the pagan nations by requiring Israel actively to drive the inhabitants away. You shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land, Numbers 33, 52. Previously in Exodus, the separation would take place by God. I will drive out according to his providential designs without explicit mention that the Israelites would take an active part in driving out the inhab inhabitants. In addition, the Israelites are commanded to destroy idolatrous images, altars, and figures that they come across. Finally, in Deuteronomy, God decrees that not only are the Israelites to be separated from the six mentioned nations, but they are to eliminate these people. In the cities of these peoples that the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes. But you shall destroy them, the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jerusites, as the Lord your God has commanded, that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practices which they have done in the service of their gods, and so to sin against the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 20, 16-18 As it is evident, this war of total destruction, Cherem, is an example of later concessionary law, law made because of Israel's weakness. The reason for the concessionary law, according to Petrie, is that the Israelites demonstrated to God that if they mingle with people of other nations, they will very likely adopt these people's idolatrous practices. Therefore, although not the original intention of God, God commands in certain cases by way of concession, a total warfare. This helps to ensure the Israelites will one day fulfill their fundamental vocation to be a light to the nations, Isaiah 49, 6, by leading other nations to worship the one true God.